Hello, I'm Lucy Commissar, an investigative journalist who writes about corporate and financial corruption. Since the 2000s, I have looked into the corruption of naked short selling, a scam on the stock market where traders sell shares they don't own and never deliver. Today, I am interviewing lawyer Wes Christian, who has done naked short selling cases for over two decades, and uh, David Wenger, who founded Share Intel, a company with software that assists in finding naked short selling. The questions were sent by members of the Retail Apes, which originated globally via social media during the lead up to the GameStop short squeeze frenzy of January 2021, and is now an open source research and advocacy movement to promote better markets and uncover market manipulation and corruption. The broadcast is sponsored by Naked Truth, a new nonprofit of market professionals, academic experts, and lawyers, including Wes, to target market manipulation and help educate and enforce accountability for fair markets. Naked Truth invited me to be the interlocutor to ask the questions. The first section is about naked synthetic phantom shares, and Dave runs a company that deals with just that. So Dave, can you explain what Share Intel does and how it connects to fake shares? Sure. Uh, Share Intel was created many years ago uh, in very simple terms to track ownership. Ownership um, that is you know, far greater and deeper and more comprehensive than just tracking 13D, 13F institutional filings, which is of course, where Bloomberg and others, you know, Thompson and others built their fortunes, you know, tracking institutional ownership. The key to tracking ownership, however, as it relates to this conversation in particular, goes deeper than tracking institutional holdings. It, the, the challenge becomes on a comprehensive basis. How do, how do, you, how do you know what, you know, who, who and what is behind all of the trading on Wall Street? Who, who are the beneficial owners down to the name and address uh, for example, on a retail level, and that information can only be obtained with, you know, with permission of the C-suite. We we become an authorized agent on behalf of the issuer client companies, our clients, which are public companies, to drill down behind broker dealer and shareholder move, essentially down to the name and address, identify who's buying, who's selling, who's friend, and who's foe. To the extent we can do that, it's not a perfect science, but it's as close to it's the best tool that is out there. It sounds like shameless self-promotion, but if, if, in, term, in terms of uh, understanding who is actually a, an owner of your shares at any given moment in time. Does that sound reasonable, Wes? Yeah, I think that's accurate. Yes. Now, uh, Rex Show, short for short selling, provides a naked shorting exemption for legitimate market making. Explain market making. And is there an objective standard to determine when a line has been crossed between legitimate market making and price suppression market manipulation? Is that something that Share Intel could catch? Yeah, so you're, you're, you're talking about what happens essentially in a given day. So first you have to start with who is a market maker. A market maker by definition and by rules and regulations basically is required to be a maker of markets. In other words, they should sell, they should buy, they should buy, they should sell. Uh, I, would, I would give you an analogy of almost a, a bookie, <laughs> almost, basically. They're there to, to generate activity. Uh, and yes, it's true that a bona fide market maker, the word is actually bona fide, or the phrase is bona fide, and that's a key phrase, is the only one uh, left under Rex show that isn't required to have a reasonable basis to locate stock before they execute a short sale. The problem is, is that what, what we've seen and what I think the SEC has seen in many market makers is that they are principally executing shorts and not really making a market. It's become a place to house illegal trades in my view, in my view. So ultimately, uh, my, uh, my, one of my goals is to ultimately do what I can to help eliminate that exemption in part or have alternatively have the SEC truly require more audits of their activity to, to justify their existence as a bona fide market maker, because I submit many of them are not bona fide market makers. If there are a significant number 
of naked or synthetic or phantom shares discovered via share intel. Could that process or discovery cause a halt in trading? Generally not. I mean, it would have to be brought to the SEC's attention. And Wes, you could you could opine on this, but but uh, you know, to the extent that we uncover what we find is the markers of illegal short selling, naked short selling, we see this routinely in in in, in on a daily basis with with our client companies and. And uh, unless that information were, I guess, presented to the SEC in a fashion that the SEC wanted to halt markets, it's it's not going to happen. To what extent uh, can Share Intel calculate the exact number of shares in circulation, legal, naked, synthetic? We can come as close as uh, as you know certain restrictions will allow us. We can we can assemble we can assemble. 90% of the puzzle pieces, for example, it, 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 we don't need to assemble 100% of the puzzle pieces to, to determine, and I'll let Wes pick up on this and talk about this and elaborate, but, but uh, you're never going to see 100% unless, unless you gain access to the, what I would imagine are the prime brokers books and records. Yeah, I, I would add to that quickly that, that yes, in, in my view, uh, you know, and that's the reason I've used Share Intel for so many years. Um, it, it can get as close as can be gotten. Uh, remember, though, that Share Intel's records are really uh, taking their patented software and analyzing data that goes through the Depository Trust Corporation. Uh, you know, proxy agents like Broadridge, uh, transfer agents, uh, the DTC, and the like. What it excludes, which is what David's referring to, is X clearing. Uh, don't forget, there is X clearing uh, trades also broker to broker, as well as trades that somehow end up outside the purview of the SEC in London and other places. But excluding those, then I would concur with David that, yes, they can truly tell you who has the shares, who doesn't. Well, if you have that information, uh, how likely is it that simply contacting the compliance desks at offending major brokers would lead them to cease such illegal practices and cover those positions in the market. And who would be contacting them? Look, we, we've had a lot, of, a lot of experience contacting um, or helping companies with language in an inquiry that might be made, for example, to compliance. In some cases, it produces results. In other cases, it doesn't. And it's, and it's really complex in, 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 its, uh, in its approach. In the, I'll let Wes elaborate. Yeah, so to, to me, I see it a little differently. Uh, David and I agree on most things, but this one I'll disagree with him on a little bit. Uh, I think it's a rare instance that actually the compliance department will do something about it because the, the cases that get brought to me have such systemic uh, levels of counterfeit shares that ultimately that brokerage firm you know, has a major bet made on the fact that they're going to keep that stock under control. And so sending them letters isn't really going to get you there. But there's certainly no downside to doing that. And David's firm is the one that typically does that. Uh, the 13 F disclosures were to, referred to a little before. Those are to the SEC. They report on holdings by large institutions. Can bad actor institutions use naked shorting and 13 F disclosures to fraudulently represent that they have controlling voting power? and can even pass res resolutions such as authorization for share offerings since retail ownership is not disclosed, disclosed via 13F. Can share intel protect retail investors against institutions that are hijacking votes? Well, I, I, again, it's a complex topic. Uh, I, I think a lot, the system, the way the system is currently designed takes advantage of the fact that most, most retail investors in particular uh, if not others, don't vote their shares. You know, at, at the end of the day, uh, you know there 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 can be there's plenty of room for manipulation. And you know I'll I'll let I'll, again I'll let you know Wes you know jump in on this. But but uh, but creating transparency in and around ownership can you know shine a light on on what may or may not be happening uh, as it relates to a vote or or any type of uh, manipulation that. You know, would cause harm to the to the to the shareholders. Yeah, I, I think that the I'll add that I think that uh, you cannot really use the 13F to to hijack the votes. 
I think the hijacking is the fact that in every case, there's massive overvoting because there's many more shares issued than those that are issued and outstanding by the corporation. And so ultimately, a multiple number of retail investors' votes don't get counted. Although I agree with David, most people don't vote, but those that do vote, a lot of those don't get counted because ultimately the Broadbridge and the brokers figure out a way to zero out the, the overvoting in order to hold the annual meeting or the, the meeting that's taking place. So that's the hijacking that's going on. Uh, would litigation allow offending brokers off the hook in regard to covering illegal short positions in the market? Many in the community are represented by the apes that, that uh, pose these questions do not want litigation to provide a cheaper means for them to cover those positions via a settlement in or out of court. And can you ensure everyone, them, uh, that you will never allow an offending party to settle outside of purchasing shares in the market, and that is for West. Yeah, so I would say that uh, the bottom line is is that uh, as a lawyer, I can never ethically uh, uh, you know, take a settlement or not. That's in the client's domain. So ethically, the client always determines to settle or not. We've settled cases where they were required to buy shares. We've settled cases where they weren't required to buy shares. I'll submit to the to the uh, you know Wall Street bets a uh, you know uh, Reddit community that uh, first and foremost we've got to continue to expose this and put it forward and, and the only way you can do that in my opinion is through litigation. So litigation ultimately is the ultimate tool that's going to cause change along with what they're doing by you know in, in effect being a bigger bully than Wall Street when they get together the the, the, the Reddit crowd. So ultimately, it takes both in order to cause change to this illegal space. If brokers were exposed to having uh, at, that they were having these illegal short positions, and if they were forced to cover, and that process caused bankruptcy before they could cover, would the bankruptcy nullify those positions? It depends on the pursuit of the plaintiff. Generally speaking, a bankruptcy will not, will not wipe out a fraud. So most frauds and most crimes are not dischargeable and bankrupt. Uh, ultimately, uh, that, that uh, exception applies only when the creditor, that would be the people that didn't get their shares in effect from the agency or the institution that filed bankruptcy. So they would have to file a proof of claim. And again, I'm not a bankruptcy lawyer, but I have fought dischargeability in bankruptcy court as a litigator. So ultimately, uh, if you can prove that it was uh, uh, that, that position, that debt was obtained by fraud, then it's not dischargeable. Now, the next question I think you've partly answered, and that was uh, if your past settlements of naked shorting cases outside of trial was just a slap on the wrist like SEC enforcement. I, I think the short answer is uh, I would agree with you that the settlements, uh, which many of which I can't disclose, uh, are sometimes uh, minuscule compared to the Hundreds of millions have been stolen, but the reality is, is you have to start somewhere. And ultimately, as, as we've gone through this for 20 years, and I know our firm has litigated 20 of these cases and, and, and have two pending right now, uh, one, in, one in Utah and one in New York. The bottom line is, is that uh, the way to expose this and cause change is to continue beating the drum and making people pay. What they end up paying is a different topic, but nonetheless, uh, continuing to expose it is going to cause journalists to get involved, SEC to get involved, you know, Reddit to get involved. So we just need to keep adding more to the stack to cause change. Now, the next question, uh, which uh, was I, uh, put by the, the APES community, this relates to Mark Cahotis, formerly a short seller connected to two important court cases relating to short selling. In the first, he and Gradient, a research firm, paid Overstock.com $5 million to settle a case where Gradient was accused of putting out fake information before Cajodes shorted the stock. In the second legal case, Cajodes testified against Goldman Sachs in an Overstock suit, accusing Goldman and other prime brokers of creating fake shares as part of naked shorting. 
Wes, were you involved in either of these cases? I was. Uh, originally, John O'Quinn and I were the ones who hired the lawyers at the firm Stein and Lubin in San Francisco and taught them everything about this space. We prosecuted the case uh, to ultimate settlement in the grading analytics case, which was a separate case. We filed as counsel the uh, case against Wall Street, Goldman, Merrill, et cetera. But ultimately, after O'Quinn's death, uh, the the company, uh, with my permission and agreement, uh, agreed to just carry on on an hourly basis uh, with uh, the very fine lawyers that uh, that John and I had hired there in San Francisco. That culminated in a separate settlement that I was not a part of because at that point we had left the case. So I would say shortly, a short answer, we, we did the first case and we did probably half of the second case. But the uh, lawyers, the local counsel I hired, finished that second case directly with oversight. Now, a number of allegations by Cajotes were aimed at you, Wes, on a January 13th Twitter space call, including that you threatened bodily harm to Mark Cajotes' disabled son. He was talking about people involved in that first case, accusing him of conspiring to put out false information about overstock. And here is what Cajote said in that audio recording. This is just two of his accusations. He is a despicable, unethical lawyer. This whole gang, including Wes Christian, threatened to kill my son. Now, what evidence was supplied? Can you tell us your side of the story? Because a lawyer might lose his or her license if such allegations were true. Yeah, my side of the story is, is pretty simple. I heard about this from several members of the ape community and the Reddit community, as well as colleagues, they could not believe it. Uh, of course, it is patently false, not a word of it's true. And ultimately, I did a very comprehensive and large demand letter. That demand letter when sent out to Mr. Coda's new address. I'm not going to disclose what that address is. Uh, within a couple of days of his receipt of that letter, I got a phone call from his lawyer that said, we're going to, we are going, because I demanded an immediate retraction or I was going to take legal action. And that lawyer said, absolutely, he's going to retract it, every single one of them. Uh, now, now we will play the retraction, which lasts about three minutes, and which you can also listen to at nakedtruth.info, along with the West Christian demand letter. I response a space call on Twitter on January 13 of this year, I made a few statements about Wes Christian that were incorrect, and I'm now retracting them. Specifically, one, I said Wes Christian is lucky he wasn't disbarred for the shit he pulled. I retract that statement. Two, I said Wes Christian is despicable, an unethical lawyer. I retract that statement. Three, I said this whole game to the extent that statement referred to Mr. Christian, I retract it. Four, I said this is a despicable group. To the extent that statement referred to Mr. Christian, I retract it. Five, I said if Wes Christian represents this group or has anything to do with this group, I am officially gone. That is how bad he is. I retract the statement that Mr. Christian is bad. Six, I said the whole crew is as bad as can possibly be. To the extent that statement referred to Mr. Christian, I retract it. Seven, I said Mr. West Christian is as big and bad of a scumbag as you can find. I retract that statement. Eight. I said John O'Quinn miraculously had an auto accident and he perished. So Overstock got rid of Wes Christian and the late O'Quinn. I retract that statement. Nine, I said all you need if you talk to Wes Christian, please give me the story how he threatened to kill Cahotas' kid. To the extent that statement referred to Mr. Christian threatening my kids, I retract it. Ten. I said it happens to be true. You can Google Mary Hellburn, NCANS, West Christian, John O'Quinn. To the extent this statement implied that my statements about Mr. Christian were facts, I retracted. 11. I said he's lucky he still has his law license. 
I retract this statement. And finally, 12, I said, I am just bringing it up, certain things you don't forget. To the extent that I referred to Mr. Christian, I retract it. That is all I have to say on that famous January 13th space call. Back now to a question about um, share intel. What are the chances that, this is from the apes, that David, that you sell share intel if offered a massive amount of money from a bank, a hedge fund, a prime broker, market maker, or anyone else indirectly associated with firms that have the means to carry out illegal market manipulation? I guess that means that uh, will these big firms buy your company to neuter it? And would you sell? You know, I, I'll add a twist to that because, you know, I, I would invite any of the prime brokers today to deploy our system uh, by me, but, but use it use it in a way that is good you know, for pr use our system to prove that you're not, not doing this. Use our system, use our patents, own our patents. And one of you take the lead. The rest will have to follow, you know, take, take the, take the lead, uh, deploy our services, prove to the world that you're not doing what, what, uh, you know, so much of the evidence suggests that you are make sense. Now, uh, also uh, posed by the apes thinking about, why bad actors might worry about companies checking out share data. The AMC shareholders last year were able to have their personal share counts verified via a financial services company, which communicated directly with their brokers and compiled an accurate count. More, more than 63,000 shareholders participated <clears throat> in corresponding to nearly 68 million shares. The average shareholding was over 1,000 shares per shareholder. This significantly contradicts AMC's own internal count, where CEO Adam Aaron stated in June 2021 on Twitter that about 4 million holders each own, on average, about 120 shares. Many shareholders felt the discrepancy suggested that the first average share count was indicative of a float bloated with naked synthetic stock. Aaron stated via Twitter in July that AMC was unaware of any information suggesting naked shorting of AMC. With that said, do you believe that hiring third-party experts to audit the float for naked synthetic shorts and evidence of float manipulation is, should be required as a chairman's fiduciary duty to protect the shareholder and share price? I think absolutely. I think you need it, it should be required. It should be required because in order to uphold their fiduciary duty, once there is some circumstantial evidence of a fraud, the board must not should or shall, they must take action. And so ultimately this needs to be in their arsenal. I will tell you though, uh, that I've used other services and ultimately the one that, that has the most specificity and has the most drill down uh, and it is David's company. And that's why we've stuck, stuck with them. And most importantly, most importantly, the evidence we've obtained from his company has survived the motions to dismiss in courts of law. So that, that's the critical piece right there. So it has enough specificity because when you go to court, you have to be very specific as to what the illegal behavior is and tie that to a cause of action. And ultimately, that has survived uh, in multiple complaints over the years. And that's where the rubber meets the road, in my opinion. So, yes, it should be required. And in fact, I, in, in, in GameStop and others, I've tried to get the board to get involved. And I know uh, on, on the Naked Truth website, uh, I've posted form letters for people to send to the CEO requesting that be done. Many of the apes have done that. I don't know how many. But ultimately, uh, the boards need to wake up and do something to protect their shareholders. Where does most responsibility lie to hold a CEO to account? With the chairman, with the independent directors, with all the directors? It depends on the bylaws, Lucy, but ultimately, certainly the chairman, you know, there's a principle in law that the buck stops at the top. Now, ultimately, you have to show that at some level, the person at the top either ratified the behavior below or was was uh, uh, had knowledge of the, the complaint of behavior. But ultimately, it is the CEO of that company and its board, both seniorly and collectively, that is responsible for 
actions or inactions that are something beyond the business judgment rule. Okay, now we're going into a different area related. FTDs fails to deliver. You bought the share, you didn't get it because the seller was a short seller and he never delivered it. Retail investors are often trolled by short sellers and the mainstream media telling them that fail to deliver data released by the SEC is accurate and indicates there isn't a significant amount of FTDs in regard to AMC or GameStop. What do you think? I think the fail to delivers as published by the SEC uh, are grossly inaccurate. And we've proven that in, in virtually every case we filed that you might ask why. Well, the reason is there's X clearing. The reason is shares are parked sometimes overseas uh, on subsidiary companies. The reason is, and this is all incidentally in FINRA and SEC uh, regulatory actions pretty much. Uh, the reason is, is there are the ways that they can create artificial shares and ultimately have that count against some of their negative positions like a put and a call creates a synthetic share. I could go down the list. So no, it's not accurate almost in every case by a very large uh, amount, frankly. On, on X clearing, uh, if some in, that are watching this don't know, X clearing means clearing outside the, of the DTCC. And it's either in a company, which is so huge, a company like Goldman, for example, where it has uh, clients on both sides of the trade. So it can just net out the buy and sell and never report this any place, or uh, it could be between two cooperating behemoth uh, traders where they agree to swap and and, and do trades be uh, between each other and also never report it to the DTCC. That is X clearing. And that's why, as you said, the numbers are not really real. Now, is there any way to discover the true amount of FTDs? The answer is first start with, with David's system as the baseline, because he'll capture a vast majority of it. Uh, secondly, uh, litigation, frankly, discovery. Uh, in discovery, we can make people set the deposition, make them uh, produce documents. If they don't produce them, we can go to court and compel them to produce them. And we've done that time and time again in both state and federal courts across the land over the last 20 years. And ultimately you can ultimately through rigorous litigation and it's rigorous uh, determine uh, where all the undelivered shares are, the, 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 the real fail that delivers. And that number would astonish you in most cases. Now the DTCC, the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation was set up to settle trades and it gets reports of fails to deliver when uh, trades uh, are cleared or attempted to be cleared through its own uh, offices. What does it do when it finds out about fails to deliver? Well, number one, it, it, it used to, in, in a, a large way, try to settle those trades through the NSCC, which is a subsidiary they purchased in the late 90s uh, or early 2000s. Uh, secondly, they have another entity, if you go to their website, called the Obligation Warehouse, which is an entity that, interestingly enough, appears to me, uh, I haven't sued that entity or discovered their documents, but it appears to just house fails to deliver. And so ultimately, those fails to deliver sit at the Obligation Warehouse and they make attempts to fill them. Now, how many get filled, I don't know, but I'm suspicious that it's not too many. But uh, ultimately, needless to say, not enough is being done by the DTC to uh, resolve these fails to deliver. But it, what do you, why, why would you expect it to? They're a self-regulatory organization. They regulate themselves. And ultimately, uh, from where I sit, they are the main perpetrators of this scheme, certainly based on FINRA and SEC fines and regulations. So as we say uh, in the ranching community, I would grew up in, in Texas, the fox is in the hen house. <laughs> now, uh, the the DTCC puts out lots of numbers. Do they put out numbers about uh, FTDs? Do they say how many at the moment they are holding that have not cleared? David, you want to answer that? You want me to? They do. And, 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 and to the point, it's a self-regulating organization. So they report what they want to report, in, in essence. Okay. Or they cover what, you know, what they want to hide. And, and, and there's a number of ways of doing that. But, uh, you know, one of the one of the gentlemen on, on my advisory board, uh, John Bloor, uh, 
He was uh, part of the enforcement division uh, at uh, the SEC back when S- SHO was was created. And he, I think he was one of the co-authors. And he, he mentioned at the time, um, which is why he agreed to get involved with us, that Reg SHO never had enough teeth and, and doesn't today. So, um, uh, yeah, at, at the end of the day, you know, we, our system, you know, creates transparency in and around what is not being reported. I think that's fair to say. If, would you say that's fair that's to say, Wes? Yeah. yeah that's good to remind that that reg show, SHO, was, went into effect in 2005 and was supposed to deal with, maybe end, naked short selling. And, of course, it didn't. Um, now, there's a favorite technique, seems to be a favorite technique, for naked shorting, and uh, that is the use of high-frequency trading. Uh, and how how is that used? Uh, and also X clearing, which we talked about a moment ago. How are those tactics used to uh, affect and hide naked short selling? Yeah, well, it, 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 high-frequency trading poses a lot of problems, uh, which is typically done with certain logarithms. You know, high-frequency trading typically has programmers involved too which I know is, is, is the next question. So I'll just take two of them at one. Basically with those logarithms, if you look at the SEC investigations and fines that have been issued, you know, they're programming computers to mark a short sale long. They're programming computers to take a hard to borrow stock, which puts it in a different category and makes it easy to borrow. So it causes a lot of problems. One, they're, they're pre-programming their computers to lie intentionally. <laughs> so you have to figure out is, is it true or is it a lie? So you have to spend a lot of money first figuring that out. And once you figure out it's a lie, then you have to figure out what happened to that lie along the way, following that trade through either David's system or litigation or both. And ultimately it will culminate in, you know, showing that the trade failed. But ultimately that allows you to make, make my job much more difficult and frankly, David's too. Because ultimately, in order to track all this down, you have to go through high frequency platforms, deal with the logarithms associated with it, track down the X clearing, track down the other places that, that the fails are hidden. And that, that's just a big job that, frankly, most people can't afford to do because of the enormous amount of work, at least on the legal side. On David's side, it, it, it's a different, different issue. You want to comment, David? It looks like you want to say something. It's 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 still a monumental task, you know. It's it's it's, it's an enormous amount of data, and 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 to track that data, you know, on a granular level is 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 cost prohibitive. It just is. It shouldn't be. I mean, it, 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 it you know, we're living in a in an age of ones and zeros. A lot of, a lot of what drives our system or, or any 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 uh, algorithm um, uh, that would be designed to analyze something, um, you know. The data component should be, you know, should be made available uh, if for transparency reasons, and and there shouldn't be this in th- this nuisance. It's more than a nuisance; it's an exorbitant cost when you try and uh, add up all the data that needs to be analyzed to to you know track high frequency trading. Now, a specific question was put, which is, how is it used to suppress or manipulate price and pin options? Those are options at the strike price that will shortly expire. And can one firm do it, or is it always in collusion with another? I think it, it, from where I sit, it's typically done colluded with another. Uh, what you're going to find, and in, 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 in pin options are, I, I guess, a, a topic of current discussion. But in essence, I, from where I sit, that's also used as a manipulative tool. Imagine that you take a, a bunch of puts with, with another co-perpetrator, and the, the other side has the call part of that. Uh, you enter into a contract for an enormous amount of shares, you know, 50,000 shares, 100,000 shares. We call Please it- ex- explain puts and calls to people that might not know. Yeah, a, a put essentially is a someone who is willing to take a position and, and enter into a contract that is betting that the stock is going to go down. So it would it would give a, it would signal to the marketplace that there's something wrong with the company. A call is somebody that has the opposite view and is entering into a contract to purchase stock at a different price, typically betting that the stock is going to go up. The problem is with what the illegal behavior is in the pin options and the option market is that a lot of these contracts are getting in, entered into with a put and a call 
by two participants who never intend to consummate that contract. Their purpose is to signal to the market something that they want to happen to the stock. And, and it's just another lie, if you will, that's perpetrated by uh, illegal actors in order to move the stock typically downward. How is this uh, manipulation uh, furthered by uh, the use of dark pools? Well, again, uh, and I think David would agree with this, Lucy, um, the dark pools poses many problems. One, you can't tell who's doing it until you get inside the beast, okay? So uh, that, that, that automatically causes problems. Two, uh, I don't think it's regulated sufficiently. So ultimately, I think a lot of the illegal actors are migrating off exchanges. In the old days, you know, stock on the NASDAQ traded on the NASDAQ, stock on the New York Stock Exchange traded on the New York Stock Exchange. But with the acceleration of illegal actors in the space, most of them are migrating to the dark pools, to the high speed trading platforms, to the other pipes, if you will, going back and forth between Canada and, and the States. Explain how dark pools work, please. David, you want to take that? I'm, I'm not the expert on dark pools. Yeah, well, I mean, I I would rather throw that, you know, that technical explanation to somebody else's hands. But suffice it to say that there's a, a significant lack of transparency and that transparency uh, is what's critical and needed uh, in, in, in terms of identifying and stomping out market manipulation of, of, of any kind. But in, fe in effect, dark pools are exchanges, in effect exchanges, that are run by the big broker dealers. They're, and they're not the New York Stock Exchange. They're not NASDAQ. They're, they're the uh, Goldman dark pool or the JP Morgan dark pool. They run these trading platforms, which deals then comes to your point about transparency. Yeah, that, that's what I understand, Lucy, but much like David, I'm not an expert, but that sounds correct to me. Okay, let's let's get into... Uh, I think areas. the dark pools are morphing. Go ahead. Uh, morphing how? No, I, I, I think that the, the, the dark pools and whatever, whatever game needs to be played to avoid transparency is constantly shifting and morphing. Uh, mm -hmm. So... What was true yesterday about, you know, a particular entity in, in how it operates, you know, is, is constantly shifting and, and changing this day ahead of this game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, uh, another area, which is about um, uh, dividends. This gets we're getting into technical stuff uh, that the apes asked us about dividends and debt covenants. And please explain these. Uh, Dave, you have said that creditors often play a malicious role in synthetically manipulating the stock of their clients. And interestingly, uh, the AMC uh, CEO, Adam Aaron, stated that he is debt covenant bound, preventing him from issuing a dividend. What does that mean? You know, I don't recall saying that. I don't know where, who quoted me, you know. Uh, uh, well, I can, I can take that. So. I can take that, David. So. So what that means is, I believe, and again, I haven't looked at, at Adam's documents, uh, but what that means is typically documents would, would have negative covenants in it, loan documents or debenture documents that said, we're going to prohibit you from issuing a dividend. Typically, a lender or a funder would put that in there to make sure that you're going to pay attention to paying their debt first and not paying your shareholders first, because a dividend is typically a, a uh share or cash that is issued to each shareholder who holds a share uh, based on a board uh, voting to say, okay, we've got enough money, we're going to issue a dividend to its shareholders. In fact, a lot of people in the investing community uh, like dividend stocks, especially when you get older, because it gives you additional income. So there are a lot of uh, companies like Exxon here in Houston, you know, that, that treasures their dividends. So they'll They'll always issue a dividend. So what, what I think he was saying is he can't issue a dividend because of the debt covenants. But I can assure you that doesn't preclude him from hiring Share Intel to figure out where the counterfeit shares are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so can you, right. speak to the, can you speak to the validity of this argument and also the pushback that AMC might get from their creditors if they took a different position? Well, the, the validity of that argument really has no application as to what the solution to the problem is. 
uh, issuing a dividend, I can tell the apes uh, that we're talking to today in the investment community uh, is not the solution to the problem. There are other people like Gary Vallinati and others that I worked with, you know, 18 years ago who tried to issue a dividend, but ultimately, the, the, in some cases, the brokers just did, didn't have the shares, just paid the dividend to their clients because it was a small amount or just ledgered it over, you know, in some ledger book. So that didn't accomplish anything. You must figure out immediately who has been issuing your shares that aren't authorized and, and call them on the carpet and do something about it. You litigate or settle with them or do something, but you've got to figure out who is selling your shares is not authorized to sell them. It doesn't deliver. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, lastly, in the, in the same area, uh, would the creditors uh, declare AMC in default of their bonds if they enter entertained a dividend mechanism exposing illegal, illegal manipulation of the float? Um, I don't know the answer to that. That would depend on the actual covenants and the documents themselves. Uh, I can understand why a dividend being issued might disturb. Uh, it would be a typical covenant. Uh, I don't understand why all the other investigative uh, tools we've talked about to figure out how, you're, how the company's being defrauded. I can imagine that any creditor and any lender would applaud you looking into uh, how to stop fraud against the company because ultimately, ultimately fraud against the company will cause the company at some level to fail. Uh, let's get on back to uh, an issue that was very front and center uh, over a year ago is the possibilities of short squeeze is exposing illegal synthetics, that is fake shares, and thereby causing a short squeeze illegal. It gets back to intent. I know I can tell you without disclosing attorney-client privilege communications that in many of the cases we've handled Overstock, Taser, Pet Quarters, Eagle Tech Communications, down the list, uh, Sedona that you're familiar with, Lucy, there were conversations uh, had with the SEC where they said, you know, you can't intentionally cause a short squeeze, you, you know, because that's stock manipulation. Mm -hmm. And so it gets back to intent. As, as, as long as you're not intending to cause a short squeeze, but rather are seeking to determine who has defrauded shareholders, seeking to figure out who's, who's issuing counterfeit shares, seeking to figure out who is holding shares that don't exist, you're duty bound to do those things. And that is not manipulation. If, if however, there's a secret meeting amongst the board where they say, we're going to short squeeze them, you know, then potentially that could be manipulation. Mm -hmm. And into another, now a new question is, the new SEC chair, Gary Gensler, uh, what do you think that Gensler meant by the statement at his testimony to the House Financial Services Committee in October 2021? He said, while there is fragmentation amongst trading platforms, past reforms and new technologies may have led to more segmented markets and higher concentrations among market makers nearly half of the volume transacted, transacted is executed in dark pools or by wholesalers. One firm has publicly stated it executes nearly half of all retail volume. Uh, furthermore, I wonder whether this means that the consolidated tape, the so-called national best bid and offer, fully reflects the full range of activity on the exchanges. Is he alluding to trading being done secretly and not reporting on, recorded on the tape? Does this question whether the consolidated tape, the national best bid and offer, fully reflects the full range of, of activity on the exchanges? He's raising very key critical questions. And, and, and I, think, I think that uh, the world would like to know the answers to these questions. And, and I, I think it involves getting very granular with, with uh, in, in, those, you know, in particular, that one company that executes, you know, that is, executes, you know, 50% of the transactions today. Is, is that impacting the inside market? You know, this gets down to you know, granular market making activities. Is, is, does that affect the inside bid and ask? I bet it does. You know, is, is, is you know, <clears throat> you know, this pay for order flow business, you know, supposedly benefits the retail crowd, but we can see in the GameStop scenario that it really doesn't. So how is it impacting the inside market? I, I think that 
the question, the great question that needs to be answered and examined. Of course, he was talking about Ken Griffin and Citadel. Um, the SEC voted in favor of changes to private fund disclosures to increase transparency in regard to hedge funds and more. Uh, do either of you think that the new requirements, if instituted, would clean up the synthetic phantom share problem in the markets? Absolutely 100% not. Let me be clear and crystal clear about my position on this. Until you force a buyer or force a seller to deliver the share that they sold to a buyer, nothing's going to change. Until you force prime brokers from lending a share only once until it's returned, not giving locates on the same share 10, 15, 20, 100 times, nothing is going to change. Why I welcome transparency, Mr. Gensler, and uh, appreciate the progress that the SEC is making on more transparency. That is important. That is not going to solve the problem because, mind you, most of these trades are being done by the proprietary trading desk of the very people that are illegally clearing them and illegally loaning stock. So ultimately, you have to force the buy-ins. And if they don't deliver the share, put them in jail. And you have to make sure that one share is lent out one time until it's returned or nothing's going to change. Are there any reasons that a company executive might not want to expose naked shares on its float? Listen, we run into that all the time. You can imagine, you know, and Wes will vouch for this. Once we've done some research and, and homework and we've, we've got a body of, you know, call it evidence, you know, over time that, that you know, certain participants, let's say, are running yellow lights, running big red lights, as, as they like to say uh, on Wall Street. You know, one, once that evidence exists, evidence exists, sometimes it, it may point to the very investment bank that the issuer depends on, you know, for its lifeblood. It de depends on for its next capital raise. And in, you know, in, in that instance, you can you can envision a, a, a discussion at the board level where where, you know, they have to tackle some very complex issues as to what is truly in shareholders best interest. Uh, do we point a gun? Do we load both barrels and point it at, at the investment bank that we need to do a deal with to stay alive? I'm not sure that that's in shareholders' best at that moment in time. So, you know, there are very complex issues like these and others that require not just, uh, you know, aggregating and, and analyzing the, the, the evidence that's out there, but also, you know, acting as a, as a trusted advisor in a confidential manner. Uh, to help help C suites and boards of directors navigate these complex issues, and you know, West and I have have been able to. We've been at this for many years. Um, I, I think I think that the, the the team that West has assembled, in conjunction with the team that I've assembled, is, is the C suite board of directors' best bet in getting their arms around this very complex and challenging uh, topic. About the, the data collected by Share Intel, does the SEC not have access to this data as well? Well, uh, do they have access to it? Uh, I, I can tell you, uh, and David said this publicly, that, that ultimately uh, David tried to meet with the or met with the SEC under an NDA uh, with them and tried to uh, persuade them to, you know, use his system or buy his system or do something. Uh, you know, similar to that. Uh, I don't know where that's went. David can uh, opine on that. Uh, can the SEC issue a subpoena and ultimately require David's company to produce certain things? Probably so. Uh, do they routinely? I don't think so, but I'll let David weigh in on that. Well, again, I, look, years ago, you know, we we approached the SEC and, you know, with the idea that we've got we've got a solution in today's world. I'm not talking about reinventing the world and, 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 and reinventing the entire system where maybe blockchain could be the ultimate solution. I'm talking about today's world right now. You know, we believe we have a simple and elegant uh, macro solution to this problem. If the SEC would deploy our services, uh, we could create transparency in and around um, share ownership that would you know, help curtail a lot of these abuses. You know, why that never went anywhere uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty cynical about this. Uh, I, I would hope that maybe, you know, 
Gary Gensler might be in a position to revisit this now that there is a groundswell uh, from the, you know, the retail investor community, the ape community, the Reddit community. Uh, we'd like to be a part of the solution. We believe we are. Is it important to collect the data now or can it be retrieved later? Mm. It's critical to collect the data. Uh, it's close to real time because much of the data cannot be obtained retroactively. Mm -hmm. Why do companies choose to settle instead of exterminating this manipulation once and for all? Why don't affected companies team up to file a mega lawsuit? It's a great question. We've looked at this in detail. Uh, it's something that may be coming down the pipe. That's all I'm going to say right now. But, uh, but ultimately, once you include multiple companies, it gets to be uh, a lot of complexity in that lawsuit because, you know, some companies do a different business. Their stock may have gone down for other reasons. The other ones that doesn't apply to. So when you start combining plaintiffs, it gets rather complex. But I will tell you uh, that concept is being looked at uh, in a very graphic way by some very high level lawyers as we speak. Has the Fed ever taken control of stocks before in the interests of the integrity of the markets? Yes, they have. Uh, you, you'll notice, uh, uh, you know, similar to what they did in 2008, where they, cert they shut down certain financial firms, trading in certain financial firms. It, you know, the SEC certainly has the ability to halt trading under their rules and regulations and their power. Uh, they have certainly done that periodically. Typically, when they feel there's some type of fraudulent behavior going on, uh, and, and what constitutes that is a case-by-case -case situation, according to my SEC, you know, enforcement friends that are now in private practice. Um, so the answer, short answer is yes, uh, but I will tell you it's rarely used, uh, you know, for obvious reasons. They don't want to wrongfully shut down a, a trading in a company, but if there's something they suspect is fraudulent, then yes, it will get shut down. Can share intel be used as a tool to expose illegal manipulation and naked shares without legal recourse as an end result? And if so, how? Well, again, that goes back to an earlier question, I think, which is, you know, once we uncover and present evidence to, you know, the, the fiduciaries of a, comp of a public company, the C-suite, the board, um, it, uh, uh, can, can they use this or leverage this data to put pressure on compliance? In some cases, in many cases, you know, we have case studies that that show that that can can and does work. Um, you know, uh, but in any cases, it doesn't. And, and, and again, it's complex. You know, it has a lot to do with um, contingent liabilities, how dug in the shorts are, uh, whether the company really in, in, in itself it, you know, deserves to be public in the first place. I mean, is, is it a company that has a sound management, solid fundamentals, you know, earnings facility, earnings momentum? There are a lot of factors that, 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 that can play in, into, and again, that comes back to the trusted advisor role that we that Wes and I both play here in that, how best the data that we can help create in, 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 the, in the knowledge around you know, what can be done with it. Um, certainly, it, it's, it's cost effective to uh, explore reaching out and asking uh, compliance um, to explain why a lot of a lot of the data that we and analysis that we will present doesn't add up, and it's 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 always fun to to, to uh, review the answers we get and to some watch of those answers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Well, that's maybe going after one company. Can the answers yes? Fair and well, and and these tools be used without a class action involved as the end result? And David, I think has answered that. The, uh, the, the if you can get a response from the from the perpetrators and resolve it without litigation and without a class action, then certainly. The question is, simply put, how much at risk are the firms that you're trying to amicably resolve this with? If they're sitting on a $50 million problem or a $100 million problem, you're not going to resolve it amicably. It's mm -hmm. going to take a lawsuit. If they're sitting on a million dollar problem, then maybe you can. Mm -hmm. So the larger it gets, the harder it is to resolve. Do you think many CEOs of companies being illegally shorted fear using share intel or other legal means to expose the corruption? <laughs> well, look, you know, a lot, a, a lot of guys in the, in, in the C-suite and in, and in the boardroom, you know, are savvy enough to 
resist in the, in the sense, and, and I'm not saying this, I'm not saying this is a good thing by any means, but you know, a lot of them might, you know, our biggest challenge is to, I always, I always, I always tell everybody is to disarm that community, disarm the boardroom, disarm the C-suite um, because a lot of these guys might look at, at what we do is creating a hot potato. What, do, what are they going to do? What are they going to do if we, if we actually get in and uncover the evidence that this is happening? That, that falls right back into the fiduciary best practices, you know, obligation um, that Wes was just opining on. Um, you know, a lot of people just don't want to create that that scenario. Uh, if, if 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 they they want to avoid it if they have to, which is why, again, you know, uh, shareholders are our strongest advocate. You know, it it, it it's, it's really, you know, I would I would I would I would you know, encourage shareholders, however big or small. To, to put pressure on 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 C suite directors to uh, you know peel back the layers, deploy the to deploy system, help and on a discrete basis. You know, it's it's not for public dissemination. It shouldn't be out there talked about in the chat rooms. You know, every five minutes. But you know, allow allow the allow the uh, uh, fiduciaries to to gather this intelligence on, in a responsible manner. Acting on their in, on a you know in a fiduciary best practices on behalf of their shareholders to to at least you know assess whether or not you know this is happening and if it is you know consult with Wes and myself to to, to you know to determine what's in 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 the best interest here what are the action steps that are going to produce the end results short of changing the world and 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 and, and uh, you know uh, you know taking down the whole system and and, and what you know. I don't know. Makes sense. Uh, following up on that, can a company hire share Intel or other legal tools without its stockholders' knowledge? It depends on whether it's a material event or not. I mean, that the, the companies are required, and again, I'm not a transactional SEC lawyer, but I know if there's if there is a material event that occurs at the company, you have to do some type of filing, so all your shareholders are advised. Um, uh, so I would say probably yes in, in some cases, uh, but I think that'd be silly. I mean, why wouldn't you want to advise your shareholders that you're taking action, you know, uh, to, to do something uh, to, to at least keep them happy? But I, I get your point, Lucy. There are certain circumstances where you may want to do that discreetly, like David's saying. And, and yes, it could be done privately uh, and, and, and see what the information says. Maybe the information says there's nothing wrong. I doubt it. If you're if you're if your uh, company is, you know, has massive volume and if your stock is falling, usually that's a sign you have the, the, the short naked short selling cancer, as we call it. So anyway, uh, if shareholders believe their investment is being illegally manipulated, what can they do today to ensure appropriate action is taken? Well, first, they can uh, write the officers and directors of the company to do something about it, which should at least start with uh, investigating uh, who owns their shares. That needs to start, frankly, with a phone call to, to share intel uh, or somebody else. Uh, I've already told you who I use and why. Um, the bottom line is if, if a company suspects a fraud, they have a duty to investigate that reasonably and comprehensively. And to do that, you have to figure out who's selling your shares that aren't authorized. So Get, get active, uh, write your congressman, write your senator, uh, write the SEC, uh, uh, write the board, write the officers, and, and demand action be taken, period. And ultimately, you know, if you can't get any action, then get enough shareholder votes together and change the board. I'm actually, you know, without disclosing the company, dealing with that right now to where a, a, a very large group of shareholders are going to try to get together enough votes to throw out the existing board and put in a board that's going to go investigate this. So that I think is a, a good place to end the, because this is what the viewers can do. And those were the questions that were sent by the retail apes. Thank you to all the retail apes who posed these questions and to Wes Christian and Dave Wenger for their answers. In the future, Naked Truth will be hosting other videos and streaming discussions on issues of stock manipulation. Information about those events will be posted at nakedtruth.info. And please send your questions to contact 
at nakedtruth.info. You can get information about my future broadcasts on Twitter, at Lucy Commissar, <coughs> see them on my YouTube channel of the same name, and on my website, The Commissar Scoop. And uh, with that, goodbye till next time. Thank you, Lucy, very much.